Some of the most interesting, I think, are here, limonene and also cymene. These are very interesting solvents. As I said before, we have to have more solvents. So we published some work a couple of years ago which showed you can take limonene or cymene and they are really good solvents for doing very simple but very important chemical transformations like amidations and esterifications. And these reactions actually, they work really well in limonene and cymene as good as alternatives, as good as chlorobenzene, which of course is petroleum derived and rather toxic, as good as toluene, better than toluene, dioxane DMF. So good news, we can use bio-based solvents and we can use them for chemical reactions that we want to do all the time. These are probably the two most important reactions in the pharmaceutical industry, workhorse reactions. So let's think a bit more about solvents. So, you know, solvents, we take them for granted. Yeah, yeah, but they're really important. Okay, we know what they are, but you know, let's look where they're used. You can see what I said there about pharmaceuticals, 10% of the entire volume, amazing. Total global market, 20 million tons a year of solvents. That's a lot, a lot used in coatings. In cosmetics, again, for formulations and for processing as well, many, many applications for solvents. And all of them have a similar problem. They are all facing regulation which says you cannot use that you must be careful when you use that you could only use that solvent under very carefully controlled conditions many many solvents we use all the time dichloromethane hexane aromatic solvents aromatics again you see dipolar aprotics all of these are under threat from legislation because they are doing harm to us and to the planet people want green solvents how can we get them green solvents they can't do everything with limonene or cymene or ethanol or maybe ethyl acetate we have to find many many new green solvents we have a method we've developed called the sustainable solvent selection service or s4 and the idea is that we actually have a service somebody comes to us and for example they say we have a problem we are now using NMP for our agricultural chemical formulation for spraying on crops. Uh, we, we, we can't use it anymore. What can we do instead? So we work with them to help understand why do you use NMP? And what's remarkable is that many people do not know why they use certain solvents. Do you know? When you're in the lab or you're, do, you're following a recipe, you're doing something you do all the time, you're using solvents all the time. But do you think, why am I using dichloromethane. Why am I using hexane, toluene, NMP? Well, of course, because it works. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we're scientists. We should be thinking, understanding. Why do we use it? So we are trying to help people do that and then work with them to develop a greener alternative. Or some companies have an interesting possibility. They say, hey, I've got some interesting, I've got orange peel. I can make limonene. Can we use that for a solvent? Yeah, we can work with companies like that and solve companies making new solvents and again, send them on the same route so they can help develop green alternatives. So for example, one case study, I keep mentioning NMP, there's NMP, DMF's another one, dimethyl is another one. Many of the dipolar aprotic solvents that we use so much now, especially in synthetic organic chemistry and also in many formulations, many of them are now under threat from legislation. REACH is saying, no, 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 you cannot use this, you have to be careful when you use that. They're being very restrictive about solvents. So what can we do? Well, we can find alternatives. So let's have a look at an industrial case study. So working with our friends in Australia called Circa, they have a way of taking waste cellulose like waste paper and turn it into site. We can now with two steps go from there to there. Sirene is a new bio-based solvent. You can read about it in chemical communications two or three issues ago. Very recent, very new. And using that methodology, we now have a material, a solvent, which is really interesting. It can replace conventional solvents, and it's genuinely green. It passes all the tox tests. It's bio-based. It's great. It's really nice solvent to use. It's the first, we hope, of many, many, many new green bio-based solvents. If you have any ideas, try them, because the world needs new green solvents. Now, of course, you know, we've got waste cellulose there. How do we get from waste cellulose, which is a complicated polymeric stuff, into small molecules? And the biologists say, oh, you do fermentation. You can, sometimes, not so much with cellulose, mind. Fermentation is good, but it's only one technique. 
we have to have more technologies to take orange peel and waste paper and straws and bagasse and get chemicals out. We like microwaves because it's a very generic technology where you take biomass, many types of biomass, you put it through a continuous microwave process operating at low temperatures. We work at below 200 degrees because we want to keep the chemical value. If you take biomass, orange peel for example, and you heat it up to like four or 500 degrees, guess what happens? You get gases. You end up with small molecules and you have to then build them up again. We don't want to do that. We want to keep the molecular structure. We want limonene, we want pectin, we want sugars, we want interesting, big, big-ish, you know, significant polyfunctional compounds. And this is where we think low temperature microwave is really good. Now, we first discovered this method. We first discovered that microwave processing done in the right way was a really good method for processing biomass when we tried rapeseed. Now, we do a lot of rapeseed in the UK and in Europe, and we were playing around and seeing if we could improve the yield of oils from squeezing rapeseed by instead using microwave. And we found, okay, yeah, sure, you can get some pretty good yields using steamed, microwave steam distillation. And then we found if you go a little bit higher in temperature, you start to get a secondary oil, a different type of oil, which is chemically different, still interesting, but different. And you also get a char, now, the char has a heat of combustion that is about, what, 20% less than coal. It's, it's good. That is a really high energy content. You could use that. You could burn that to make energy, to make electricity. And that's what people are beginning to do. So we began to think there's something going on here. It's not just heating. There's something more than heating. And we demonstrated this in a paper last year. We published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society. And this was proving to the academic community, really, that you could take something like cellulose without adding anything at all, just water. You can use microwaves to get a really much improved yield of fermentable sugars. Sugars that can then be used to make bioethanol or succinic acid or lactic acid or many other interesting chemical molecules. Much better than using simple conventional methods. So, doing comparisons Here's bio waste, all sorts of different celluloses and starches and whatever else. Conventional acid hydrolysis gives you sugars. You then ferment those. And these are what you, we now know you can make. Ethanol, of course, especially in this country. Butanol, succinic acid, these are all growing. These ones are good. And many more. And the total value is about 14 and a half billion pounds, or about 18 billion euros. That's big. But if you also add this type of low temperature specific microwave activation, you get an alternative, you get a faster, more efficient route, which avoids salt waste. Uh, and you can also get some additional molecules as well. By using the tunability specific activation, we now know we can make waxes worth three billion pounds. Limonene, I mentioned, phenols, back to aromatics, how important they are. Uh, hydroxymethyl furfural, that key platform molecule, and levoglucosinone, which is the intermediate that we use when we make our new solvent thyrene. Total value, additional value, 7 billion. Add those two together, more than 20 billion. That's beginning to sound like a big number, you know? So these are the ways that we can start to get value out of, maximize the value we get from biomass. So for example, supposing you are working with straw, cereal straw. So in, in the UK, where I come from, we have a lot of uh, wheat straw. So you can take the wheat straw, you can say, okay, I'll densify it, I'll then use supercritical technology, which uh, is one of our favorite technologies, because you can then fractionate high value waxes from the surface of the straw. And this gives you some very interesting compounds down here. You can take the residue, use microwave processing, and from the microwave processing, you get oils and more chemicals. You can also get the solid char for making energy. And after you've burned it, you then get inorganics which I'll come back to in a moment. Oh, you can get yeah, gases. The gases could be used to drive the turbine to power the microwave, so there's no external energy needs. And all this adds up together. And if you get it right, you get a 100%, a zero waste biorefinery. That's what we really want. And you can apply that to all sorts of things. You can, you can do it for cocoa husks, making chars, making oils, which are full of chemicals, and start thinking about a cocoa husk biorefinery. These are just examples. You can choose almost any type of biomass and follow a similar pattern. Microalgae, we haven't done so much work on, but again, you can do similar, similar idea with that as well. 
And when you've burned the biochar, you get ashes. The ashes are full of chemicals. The chemicals contain silicates. The silicates can be used to make mesoporous silica, like MCM, which I'm sure you know is a very important uh, solid material for making catalysts, for example, and adsorbents and other applications. That can now be bio-based, again, bio-based. Or you can take the silicate and you can use it to bind things together, like an adhesive. For example, you can bind straws together. You can bind some of those cereal straws and make really good quality furniture kitchen furniture, which we've been working on for several years with a big UK retailer called B&Q, Compaq or a company that make boards, etc. PQ, by the way, is the world's biggest silica company. So this is a, a total waste space. Everything we use is waste. And we use that to make the world's first 100% waste space kitchen furniture, which actually, like so many things in life, was made in China. But there you go. Just briefly, one more case study. One of our favorites as well, something Vanya has been working on. So she's been doing some very nice work and using our Starbond technology. Our Starbond technology is all about taking waste, waste polysaccharides, waste starches, but also seaweed. We like seaweed. Uh, orange peel, again, because there's a pectin, we can take that as well. And we control, we put it through a controlled pyrolysis process and we make a mesoporous material we call Starbonds. All sorts of interesting properties. As you can see here, lots of different wastes can be used to make these polysaccharides, which are mesoporous. And because they're mesoporous, we can use them for catalysis. We can use them for water purification, adsorption of critical elements, and so on. We can use them in separations, which is what Varnier has been concentrating on. We can use them in electrochemistry, sensor applications, etc. They have a wonderful set of properties. If you compare them to ordinary carbons, ordinary carbons tend to be very microporous. They have a high carbon content. Now here, our star bonds, you can have various content. This means by changing this ratio, you get different surface energies. Some materials are very hydrophobic. Some materials are very hydrophilic. It depends on the surface energy, which is controlled by the oxygen ratio. But they are all mesoporous. That means they all have big pores. Big pores are great for absorbing big molecules. They're great for high rates of diffusion of molecules, for things like chromatography and many other applications as well. And here's just showing again how you get this variable functionality. All these different functions you can control on the surface of the starbond by changing the temperature of pyrolysis. And you then get a whole series of applications fitting with different sets of properties. Very controllable. So just one little example of what we've done recently. So I've got in our group, we have uh, Vanya knows, we have a lovely guy who is from Kurdistan, you know? Where is Kurdistan? So Kurdistan doesn't exist, actually. Kurdistan is a country that was blown to bits separated by uh, people like my country, I'm afraid, by the great powers, you know, 100 years ago. And they separated what was Kurdistan. Some of it went to Iraq, some of it went to Turkey, some of it went to Syria. But the Kurds still believe it's Kurdistan. So when Heyman first came, when I first met Heyman, and I said to Heyman, where do you come from? And he said, I come from Kurdistan. And I said, where is Kurdistan? And he showed me a map, and there was Kurdistan. And I thought, I don't recognize that map. And the date on the map was 1906. But as far as he was concerned, it's true today. So his real mission in life is to restore Kurdistan. Well, he also wants to go back to Kurdistan next year when he finishes his PhD with us, start a green chemistry center. And one of the things he wants to do is use star bonds to trap dyes. Because in his country, they have a big problem with pollution from dyes, as, as in many countries. And these are molecules like this. These are the molecules that you're all wearing today. You may not realize it, but I guarantee that all of you are wearing these dyes on your fabrics. They are the biggest volume so-called reactive dyes used for fabrics in the world. But they also present a tremendous environmental challenge because they end up in the water supply causing a lot of problems, a lot of problems. So star bonds actually, of, because they have big pore structures, they can absorb big molecules. Ordinary carbons cannot. So we find that if you compare, you look here, you see these are types of star bonds here and you can see how they are rapidly absorbing one of those reactive dyes, whereas ordinary activated carbon and silica gel don't do anything. You can also see that here by the size of the bar charts. Again, the star bonds at this end absorbing, in some cases, very well, but the other materials, except for one example there, do not absorb. 
So very powerful technology to allow us to purify water. Remember what I was saying about metals, all these valuable metals we are losing. Well, star bonds, not just plants, I talked about plants capturing metals, star bonds could also capture metals. And this is using uh, star bonds to trap metals from waste. So this is red mud, is the waste you get from processing aluminium. So the aluminium industry, like all other industries, makes a huge amount of waste we call red mud. And it's a real environmental problem. It's also a terrible waste. If you treat red mud with star bonds, star bonds concentrates three of those metals, lithium, cobalt, and gold. I like the fact it concentrates gold. It's like, that's my boy, you know. It's concentrating a valuable element. Very, very useful. Similarly, with so-called bottom ash, so back again to burning biomass, burning those biochars, getting energy, making electricity. What about all the ash? Full of metals. Again, the starbond technology can concentrate beryllium, zirconium, gold, and cadmium. Beryllium is on the European list of critical elements. We are running out of it really, really quickly. So again, very, very promising, very valuable. We think, by the way, the mechanism is to do with the fact that actually different metals, different species come into solution, and some of them are loosely adsorbed, but some adsorb very strongly with a specific adsorption using active centers on those star bonds. Remember I said you can control the surface energy to actually allow us to capture things. So very, very nice example of how a technology based on using bio-waste can be used to then capture very important substances from the environment. Okay, this is where I come from. So this is now, Vanya knows this by now. Maybe somebody else has been to York.